So we are kind of introduced, uh, Brian introduced us to this idea yesterday that we have hypothesis generation, peptide selection, chromatogram extraction, uh, peak integration, transition refinement, we can go through this a bit, and then, and then we can generate a new hypothesis test and, and uh, start over. Uh, so here are some ideas of how you would generate a hypothesis that is somewhat more restricted than, than just uh, just everything. And if you did, that did session one, uh, that was, that session was presented as requiring that you generate some hypotheses. Uh, are people, are, do people here have, have, so if you did session one, are you thinking about specific targets that you're interested in looking at? For our experimental stuff. Yeah, for your yeah. experimental yeah, stuff. Sure. Like, what, what kind of stuff are you, what, what are you interested in and then how, how did you get interested in them? So in this case, we have, so if you could be interested in a pathway, uh, definitely have seen interesting talks from people who are, know sort of a complex of proteins. Somebody who is, uh, I heard a talk, nice talk from somebody who is studying nuclear pores. Uh, and, you know, I've heard talks from people studying, uh, the, the, the strands that, that, that pull the chromosomes apart in, in uh, mitosis. Uh, and, and so, yeah, if you might have a, a special function in the cell that you're interested in studying, and that will, that will radically reduce the number of things you look at. You might actually be looking at a certain cellular component, uh, or you might be studying modification sites, like, like oscillation. You might been talking to pharma people who are studying antibodies, right? They're, they're actually taking really deep dives into the antibodies that they're developing as drugs. So, but, but like you say you have something, what is it? Um, phosphorylation sites on okay. our activation of the kinase. So okay. looking at very closely spaced, but they, the chromatomatic, uh, chromatic, yeah. they resolve. They separate, yeah, they separate. <laughs> but do you have specific, uh, Phosphorylation sites. In, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have like a, a couple heavy peptides for those phospho sites, uh -huh. so I can actually combine yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah, and I went. To, I, I, I actually got invited to sit on a committee for somebody in the Netherlands last summer, and they, and they were doing some really interesting, interesting work with kinases, and uh, so yeah, that's definitely an area that people are targeting. And do you have Do you have anything that you just in targeting specifically, or? Uh, so we are doing main thing as I'm in a uh, poor facility. Okay. To oh, so. bed off and oh. anything, but we have a project currently uh, targeting the trinitrile tyrosine. Okay. So that's also an application. Okay. Be useful. So yeah, there's, there, I mean, there's a lot in, in proteomics. There's a lot of uh, people wanting to just set up experiments and use proteomics to determine what's changing, that's like a very, oh, you know, like I, I want to know, I'm, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do this ex biological experiment and I want to know what's changing in the proteome. So fi find me what's changing, uh, which tends to be a more difficult problem than I've got, a, I've got an area of focus and I want to, and I want to see how things change when I, when I'm, when I do things to that area of focus. So, but anyway, so. All proteins, everything that that gets asked a lot. I mean, you know, especially at core facilities, I mean, somebody might just say like, "Well, I don't know what proteins I'm interested in. I just want to you tell me what proteins I should be interested in," <laughs> which is actually a really hard problem. But uh, it is one that that uh, label-free quantification. So tools that do that use DDA to then identify features in MS1. That's been doing for a really long time. And uh, we came along and really felt that the DIA could improve that. Uh, and so, but that, those end up being really big experiments. So we're gonna, we're gonna start with the fact that you can do DIA and you can still target things in DIA and you can get, you can just use DIA as a way of doing uh, quicker, larger target lists. Or you can, or you can take it all the way. We're later going to take it all the way to the well. What if you wanna, uh, if you do want to do this everything experiment? Um, but here, here we're suggesting, you know, you're gonna, you're still gonna be a lot better off 
uh, and there, um, there are still consider considerations on how precise your measurements are going to be. You know, when, when you go to this all proteins thing, you're going to lose a lot of precision, you're going to lose sensitivity um, o over a, a, an experiment that's designed for specific hypotheses. You have a question? Yeah. A more general question, like talking about discovery, if we don't know what we're interested in, um, I guess with DIA, it's only suited as a discovery tool if you have a really, really good comprehensive library, right? Otherwise, you might be better off with DDA, or I always get a bit confused with DIA as a discovery tool. Uh, well, well, we'll go into that more. So uh, to, to, in, in, this, in this thing, we're going to still focus on small, small scale, but we're, we're definitely getting into this, you know, into discovery and the considerations you have to make in discovery, and that, in fact, you know, some of these super comprehensive libraries end up just adding noise to your to your measurements and, and how we deal with that. that that's, that's sort of the, the punchline of this whole session is, is you can have a super comprehensive library and it might, you might actually be worse off than, than, than a, a library that's more restricted uh, because not everything's quantitative. Did you take session one? Yeah. Okay, so one of the things Lindsay Pino's been doing is Trying, trying to look at an entire, the entire yeast proteome, I don't know if she mentioned this, but this is her, her thesis is on looking at the entire yeast proteome and trying to figure out which peptides and, and proteins you can actually quantify. You know, that they actually have, a, that, that they function and have a, a linear dynamic range that you can quantify by. So she's, she's doing, so there's various levels of, of characterization that you can do with any protein or any peptide. She's trying to do it on a whole proteome scale, uh, and, and it just it turns out that yeah, okay, you can you can throw every peptide that you can see in your quantitative matrix, but some of them are just going to mess you up. Some of them are going to be degrading. Some you know like they're just not going to be helpful. So. Uh, so anyway, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. We'll do a we'll do a first level refinement. Skog, had, you know, has had this concept of refinement for a long time, and we'll see and we'll see that later in the, in the day, and uh, we'll see that tomorrow. Uh, okay, so so data data analysis uh, workflow is you know you could be just try all triptych peptides, which we don't generally do. Uh, I mean, there are tools now that are starting to do all triptych peptides. Um, we can uh, we can do high responding peptides similar to SRM, so that's what we're going to do here, I think. Uh, so we can we can pre-pick a set of peptides for proteins that we want to that we want to see. We can also whoops we can do peptides identified by DDA, so we run a DDA experiment first, and then we say, oh, I could identify this by DDA, so I probably have a pretty good chance of picking it out by DIA. Uh, and, then, and then we can use uh, a prior DIA tool, so there are some DIA tools that you now can use to find things in DIA data with no DDA data required, like Encyclopedia and a DI Empire, and then you can use stuff that's detected in DIA. So right now, uh, we're going to do identified by DDA, so we run our own DDA experiment, and we find the things that are identified by that, and if we do it on the same machine, then we can just go right into DIA, uh, and we don't even need the, the IRT that, I'm, that we're going to focus on later. So we're going to skip that part. Um, so this 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 first demo uh, is just basically what what Brian showed you yesterday, um, and then and then he you know these are some of the problems that. Uh, that came up when he just when we just did the sort of this, the dumbest possible analysis of DIA, which is just full gradient chromatogram extraction. We have no idea where the, where the peptide is supposed to be, and uh, and we have come up with these problems, which are uh, definitely in the middle. Selecting the correct peak is can be really difficult if you have the entire you know 60 minute gradient to look at, uh, and, and you know prior. Brian brought up one, you know, where obviously I chose the wrong thing and Olga chose the right thing, uh, but there, you know, you saw a lot of chromatograms colluding, and that and that was a completely different peptide. Uh, and then and then even we've seen cases already where getting the integration back.
boundaries uh, can be very difficult. Uh, and then certainly, that if you have the absence of something, it's frequently very difficult if you don't if you don't have a, a synthetic uh, label peptide that show you the boundary. So here's what we're going to do today, very simply. Uh, if you if you put some DDA runs, if you ran some DIA and you ran some DDA runs in with them, even they it could be before and after. It could be you could run them after, but that would give you identifications on the same chromatography, uh, so you need to sort of normalize. We've seen that, I mean, certainly chromatography can drift, and in that case, we're, we would need stuff like IRT and, and, norm, and normalization to get the chromatography to, to match up, but if our chromatography is stable, and we measure some DDA on either side, we can just use the times that we see in the DDA to pick the times in the DIA. In the DIA. So, uh, so we just acquire DDA along with DIA, um, and then uh, you know we map from the DDA PSMs. We put those in a library, and then we just go look for them in the D in the DIA. Uh, and, but it limits us to only the things that are identified in our DDA. And as you know, as has been pointed out, now people are frequently doing sort of high fractionation, building these huge libraries to try to say, oh, this is everything I could possibly see. Let me go query all of it in my DIA. And that, that's another strategy. Um, and then uh, in the future, so we're not going to be doing this right here, I don't think, is uh, spec we'll do this in later experiments, spectral library plus IRT, which gives us a, 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 a more flexible view of of retention time, uh, or we can use tools that go right from the DIA data without any DIA data. So but what we're going to be doing is this DDA acquisition, which everybody here is familiar with, right? This is the way it works. It just, it's collecting consistently MS1s, and then it's spitting off these MSMS. Uh, you can do chromatogram extraction on it, and, and then if you have an identification that comes from, from the same precursor, then you can identify this chromatogram here, it's kind of turned on its side, as uh, that's, that's your peptide, that's the, that's the ion, that gives you a, a sense of how the ion flow for your peptide by looking at the MS scans. And that's what it looks like in Skyline, we've seen that before. And so, yeah, let's get to the demo. All right, so now this is what we're here for in the morning. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, data that's in this DI intro. So this two proteins data, this is the data that, that Brian Searle showed you yesterday, so we're not going to really spend much time with that. Uh, we're going to go on to the, uh, to this DI tutorial, and this this doesn't. So the, the two proteins data had a, a uh, just had a skyline document. Somebody else had processed it, and we had two proteins expressed, and you could look at it in the skyline document. I can open that up again. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to start from scratch with, with just the pieces. And do it ourselves. So uh, apparently there's a missing file here, but we can just go right past it. Uh, and so this is, I believe, what Brian showed you yesterday. Yeah. OK, so but what we're going to do today uh, is just create a new file. So click New Document. Uh, and just to get everybody on the same page, uh, go ahead and choose settings default. It says settings default, but I'm not sure I totally trust it. And then say, no, I don't want to uh, save my current settings. So now we should um, we 
should all have the same same baseline document. In the first place, we'll go to um, is uh, the transition settings. So before starting with actually, so there's really creating a skyline template that you're going to import data into. Uh, there's there's choosing your targets, what's going to go in this target to you, and choosing your settings. And usually it's a good idea to choose your settings first. So we're going to go to transition settings. Um, and I'm going to start on the full scan tab. When I'm dealing with DIA data, that's where I like to start. Um, and let's go ahead and, and we're going to do DIA today. Well, let's actually, I think we can do, uh, I think we can also do MS1. So, and we'll use centroided data with a mass accuracy of 10 ppm. That works pretty well on most uh, orbit trap Q exactive data and even modern TOPS. So if you're using like a top instrument, one of the latest rounds of top instruments, 10 ppm turns out to be a pretty good default. Uh, and you, you know, all the way out to 20 ppm. But we're going to stay with 10. All right, so we're going to then do DIA for our MS, MS filtering. Again, centroid with 10 ppm is just finding a place to start. Oops. Uh, and then we need to tell Skyline about an isolation scheme. That's, so we need to tell Skyline what uh, what the range, you know, what we're going to look at. Actually, and there's this Dell Me 400 to 800, which might be our isolation scheme because we just opened that other document. May have a, the same isolation scheme, but let's go ahead and we're going to add our own and let's uh, we're going to use pre-specified isolation windows. So we have the we have the option of just telling Skyline, well, just do what use what's ever in the in, in the um, in the results itself. Um, can anybody think of a reason why we would want to pre-specify the isolation scheme? Yeah, it's determined there'd be error and what it determines the range the ranges are. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you get to see it. <laughs> like, so if, if we if we do this, then we have like so what? So now if we put pre-specified, we can import it from a file. So if we have a bunch of representative files that we got from somebody else, I've definitely seen, uh, you know, errors in the way the isolation scheme was specified in those files. Uh, it used to be that people would have to enter a pre-specified isolation scheme without looking at a file, and there could definitely be error in how those got matched up. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna try importing one from one of our files. So click import and go to this DIA tutorial and raw, and then we just pick one of these files and click open. And then Sky will look at that for a moment, and then it now tells us, though, this is what. And so this is somewhat complicated for to, you know for somebody to to reproduce. Um, if, if I'm just getting your data, I need to know something about what you did, and you can see that the the um, the window placement here is 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 not. These are not round numbers. Uh, and can anybody guess why that is? They're basically 20, 20 MZ, so I, we can actually click the graph and have a look at it. They're 20 MZ, and there's actually, there's actually gaps between them, but they're really tiny gaps. So if you, if you zoom in, you know, you can see that even when I get way, 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 like, to get them to actually show up, I have to get into the into the hundreds and even thousands of an MZ. So there, the, there are these little tiny gaps between these. 
but, but these are placed in the optimal location so that charge two and three peptides really are as far away from those boundaries as possible. And we find that that's, that's enough to get valid quantitative values without having to have overlap. So it, the Macas lab has reasons for, for not wanting that. So these are, although these are, and you can get back by doing undo all zoom and pan, uh, although there are little gaps here, which, which you know, in general you don't really want gaps in your, in your, uh, in your isolation scheme, uh, these are not going to be meaningful. And they're, just, they're really just due to rounding error. Um, so, you know, we can, we can hide them. But it, it could be that, you know, maybe somebody left, you know, missed a window in their isolation scheme. And so, so I have seen things where I bring up this graph and there's a missing isolation window. Maybe an isolation window actually gets repeated. Then you get, and then you then you'll see something where you see single cycle overlap. You see these yellow things get highlighted. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So I did this uh, in my case. I did not uh, I because I didn't open. You have a missing space. Yeah. yeah, so you're then that means if you have any precursor, if you so if you ran that method, you end up with a file that's just missing stuff, and so you'll get a bunch of precursors that, that Skyline will say, Well, I can't get chromatograms for those because you didn't collect them. So so that's that's what you lose. And, and at this point we have four hundred to eight hundred, so any 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 peptide within four hundred to eight hundred I can measure. If it's outside 400, or if it's lower than 400 or higher than 800, I can't. I, I don't have any data for it. For it in the MS7s, yeah. I didn't really pick up on why does is there no for a few peptides in this gaps? So you said that this. Yeah, it's, uh, basically, yeah. So the Jared, who came up with this, uh, describes it as you know it's because you have molecules that are made up of atoms. And when you put atoms together, it's like putting Legos together. He says, it's like, you can only get Lego, you know, you can't get like a, a teeny fraction of a Lego. Uh, and that's, that's true to some extent. And, if, and certainly like singly charged peptides are gonna, are gonna have, you know, full MZ, you know, they're gonna all land very close to one, one MZ. And then you get doubly charged. And then when you add triply charged, if you, if you wanted to be able to measure everything, quadruply, you know, quintuply charged uh, peptides, then this is not going to work so well, but we limit ourselves to doubly and triply charged. So, so that, that, then these things really do not get very close to these borders. So these are regular intervals, then? It also works with these regular intervals, or is every single gap in an optimized place? Every single gap is in an optimized place. And the way, the way we did that, so, so this is this this isolation scheme was actually calculated. So I can click calculate, and I can say 400 to 800, and window widths of 20, and I can say that I want optimized window placement. And that's it. That's all I have to do. 400, 800, 20 width, optimized window placement, and now if I click OK. I basically get the same windows. There may be some slight difference because of the rounding error and stuff, but yeah, that, that's it's basically the same windows. Now, now actually the windows are stored. We're only showing you four decimal places, but they're stored very, very precisely, and so there's no more gaps. So it, it's it's the it's the exporting into thermo software that causes those really teeny little gaps. Um, so okay, so let's we're gonna okay. aim. Yes. So if I understand correctly, by omitting those tiny gaps, you kind of get better data for everything else. So why why just not measure everything and deal with the fact that uh, there's not so much in those gaps? Where is the gain? There's nothing in those gaps. Those gaps were too, those gaps were like that they they they're not even big enough for a quadrupole like. The gaps are determined by a quadrupole. They're not big enough for a quadrupole to resolve. So, so there's nothing there. So we're just getting faster this way. You're not getting what? You While measuring. I just don't really understand 
where the gain is to do that, to what optimize gain? it? Uh, the gain is that we don't have to actually have overlaps. Okay. If we optimize, we don't have to have overlaps. Those, those little red lines, those weren't real gaps. Those were, those were, you know, so small. Like, so we're talking about a quadruple isolation. A quadruple can't actually resolve that big. And so, so they are, they were theoretical gaps. And, and, and this whole graph showing gaps is really intended to show, you know, if I, if I missed a window in the middle. And it happens to show this thing that so turns out to be a rounding error. So I was just showing you that. Don't worry about the, the gaps. Uh, but these are up, these windows are placed so that they fall between peptides. That's that's the whole point, and it works. Uh, but so we're going to call this isolation window 400 to 800 by 20. And click OK. Uh, and then. We'll go ahead and use, let's see. Say what we use here. Oh yeah, so we're gonna use MSMS IDs uh, and I guess it says here we're gonna use two minute windows. Or two minute those are gonna, that's going to produce four minute windows with two minutes on either side of the MSMS IDs. All right, click OK. Oh, no, don't click OK. Uh, instrument, we're going to say. Yeah, eight data was also centroided. Um, yes, we're, we're, we're going with centroided on everything. And well, let's skip to the skip to the filter here, and we're gonna do precursor charges two, three ion types. We're gonna stick with charge one and ion type B. Oh, and then we're gonna also add P. So P gives us the precursor. So we're gonna so as we our full scan settings said we're gonna we're gonna be extracting from MS1. So we want to have a P in the filter. Uh, in the very latest version of Skyline, as soon as you change this to show that you're filtering MS1, it would add the P in here for us automatically. Uh, and we're gonna go from ion three to the last ion. So that basically excludes Y1 and Y2 and B1 and B2, like Brian was saying. We'll get rid of this uh, proline, you know, making proline special. And who can tell me what this use DI precursor window for exclusion, what does that mean? So that means that every every time I have a precursor, it's going to fall inside of one of those 20, 20 MZ windows. So right, so I'm, I'm, I've got the quadrupole. I'm isolating twenty MZ worth of worth of precursors, and and I get a precursor that gets through that filter, and then I fragment it. And the problem that the Abrasol lab had found is is that uh, there's a lot of other stuff getting through that window too. And it may or may not get really well fragmented. And so that range, the precursor range, uh, can be pretty noisy. And so they chose not to have any fragments in that range as well. So, so that was actually in, implemented by an Abrasol lab member when they came to visit our lab. Um, and we'll go ahead and leave it. And I guess let's also, uh, on the instrument tab, let's go from 50 to 2,000. And 
let's say that we want to pick six product ions and then, and then only six product ions, why would we want to say only six product ions? Yeah, why not three? Why not three? Yeah. I, I tend to think that, I mean, we could say three, but I, my feeling is you wouldn't really want to go much lower than four, maybe five. Uh, six, six ends up being a pretty strong assertion. Uh, but yeah, if, if, I mean, I think about it. If you, you had a spectrum and you can't even find six ions in it that match your peptide, you know, how, how, how good do you feel about that? Uh, so I, I tend to think that, that saying, saying six is, is kind of a fine assertion. Uh, yeah. Well, the ion match tolerance is 0.5 over Z. Is it okay yeah. for all the devices? No, usually with, with something like an Arbitrap, for sure, we would make it 0.05, which is still like 50 ppm. So it's quite, so if you have a high resolution mass spectrometer, we usually, you know, the, the 0.5 default was, was for uh, an LDQ. So it's, it's, an, it's an original default, a lot of, you know, we had a lot of uh, ion trap spectra getting collected in the lab at the time, so did everybody else, so we used 0.5. But 0.05 is definitely more appropriate uh, in modern times. The other thing is to get Skyline to respect this ion, you know, skipping ion two, one, and two, we have to tell it to use it from fil filtered product ions. So we have to switch here, filtered product ions. So we have, otherwise it just skips this. And, it, and all it does is look at this. Can you maybe explain the settings, the three settings? Because I always get confused by it, like the one in the middle. Or what yeah, the one in the middle. I mean, <laughs> I never use it, so, you know, it's like I've talked about removing it. Uh, let's see, it's from filtered ion charges and types plus filtered product ions. So I guess that would be, you know, just in case I had. I had said I want this special ion, it would add it, even though it, even if it didn't didn't match my, my filters here, I guess. I, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, th this is more restrictive. And, th and this I believe is less restrictive, but I don't I, I can't tell you. I can't quite remember what it does. So basically if I take the last one it will pass it through the filter first yep. and then go to library and if I take yep. the first one, if it ignores the filter and goes yep. straight to library. Exactly. Yeah. Gotcha, thanks. Yeah. And the middle one, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't quite know when I tell people, yeah, I don't do the that one. Know. That one, that was, uh, I should remove it because it's just a confusing choice. Uh, so now, so we have all of our, our transition settings here. Prediction is mostly, I mean, we're gonna leave every, the precursor mass monoisotopic, product mass monoisotopic, and then the rest of this stuff is really for when you're doing SRM. So we just leave it not. And click OK. And then now we've got to do our peptide settings. And here, trypsin's just fine. Um, And let's go ahead and build a, uh, a background proteome. Uh, so we have, no, we shouldn't, uh, we have, I have a, a background proteome from a prior thing that I've been working on. But let's go ahead and add a background proteome. And we'll just call it yeast. Uh, and we click create. Who, know, who knows what a background proteome is? Do you, do you, I mean, maybe you learned in session one, right? No? They didn't talk about background proteome? Okay. Who can, who can tell me what a background proteome is? Go ahead. It's a faster file that you could load in and digest to, for example, filter for unique peptides. Yeah. Yeah, so you can filter for unique peptides. You can use it. Uh, that's one nice thing because so if, if, you, if you import like five proteins into your document and then say, okay, give me the unique peptides, 
that doesn't really matter, right? Because it's like the, the unique peptides to those five proteins that may not may not be unique within your entire sample. So what? So uniqueness is is a thing that is related to the entire sample. So and 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 basically the background proteome is just a concept that's if you have a way of saying what's in your sample, give that information to Skyline and they can do, and then Skyline can do interesting things for you, it can help you choosing, choosing targets, uh, and we'll see some of the things it can do. Um, but, but yeah, it may not be what you're targeting. It may be a subset of what you're targeting. These proteome, when we get into proteome wide searches, then really everything in the fast day we target. But uh, if we're doing targeted, if we're actually doing a more restrictive thing, maybe we're, we do a nuclear prep so we know that all we have is nuclear proteins so we can get rid of everything you know, else. Or maybe we have this, an idea of what, what shows up in plasma and we can create a, a plasma background program. So. In, in this case, if we target, uh, let's say, five protein in plasma, do you have to remove this five protein from the FASTA? No. Plasma no, no. The background proteome would include your proteins as well. Okay. Right? It's, it's the superset of everything that could be showing up in your sample. So let's go DI <coughs> intro, DI tutorial, and we'll just create the background proteome right here up at the top, and we'll call it, uh, yeah, this yeast is fine. And then you don't have to, Skyline's going to add this dot .protein to the end of it, but we don't have to just type yeast. And Skyline then will create an empty background proteome with zero proteins in it, and then we have to import. So click Add File. And then down into this fast day, and then you can see there's yeast contam. So that's, we're saying, we're going to include the, this is a yeast lysate. We're going to include the entire yeast proteome plus contaminants. So we, we actually believe that our samples may contain contaminants as well. But we don't, we don't want to be targeting any contaminants back. So click open. And that's about 6,000 or so protein sequences. And it takes Skyline a little bit of time to work through all the details because it actually it creates a fairly extensive database that allows us even to do semi-triptic cleavage and, and other interesting operations. So it has to work out the work out the trips and cleavage. So this one it says, okay, and then it also tells me that hey, there's 87 repeated sequences. So, so this FASTA file had some things with multiple names, but, but they were repeated sequences. And this is just in case, in case I happen to know the number of sequences, I did a search on greater than, the greater than symbol in my FASTA file, I might go, whoops, what, how come Skyline only found 66, 6,677, when I know that this has 6,700 and whatever. Uh, and that's because some of them got repeated and collapsed. So the, the background proteome contains one entry per unique sequence, protein sequence. But it checks only the protein name. So if the sequence is not unique, what will happen then? That's, that's what you're telling me. When it's not unique, it says the na their names will be added as aliases to ensure protein list contains only a copy of each sequence. So the name is just added as an alias. So, so you have there, you have a name and an alternative name. And, and so that's Are they what, like particularly marked? If I were now to open the background proteome, could I find those easily? Yeah, yeah, you could find those. Yeah, they're just they're just aliases. It's all you know. But basically, all it's saying is that the point is when I look at this and say how many proteins are in there, we're talking about how many unique protein sequences are in there. <coughs> So it's just translating between your concept, which was, hey, I had a, I had a flat file that had you know, 6,700 things in it, 
why did Sky, why does Skyline tell me it's only got 6,600 things? And it's like, well, because some of the things you had in your file were actually just duplicates. So we're going to treat them as if they're multiple names for the same thing, which is what they really are. Okay, so click OK. Uh, we're not going to bother with enforce, but now that we have a background proteome, we could enforce peptide uniqueness. Well, let's do it. Okay, proteins. So if you have a, a highly unique FASTA file, you can do uniqueness by protein. Otherwise, if you have a really redundant FASTA file, you might want to choose by genes. And then by species, as if you had an interspecies mix or something. And you wanted to be able to be sure that you could tell something with a human protein versus a mouse protein. Uh, OK. Um, so we don't, we're not going to actually use any retention time prediction. We didn't do IRT for this. Uh, we don't, and we're not doing any ion mobility. Uh, we're going to filter our peptides. But before we do, let's go ahead and, uh, and build the library. Are you always excluding the student? Uh, not necessarily. Yeah, we could we can go back here and say you know two two miscleavages. We can allow miscleavages. Uh, we we can also choose semi triptych cleavage if if we have search results that contain those, uh, and we'll see that uh, I think in one of the later later things. So there's there's lots of uh, flexibility there. And the important thing to remember though is the smaller the things you look for, the better you'll get. So the less things you'll yeah. Better. Yeah, you get so you start to look for lots of things with this cleavage and things you're gonna lose your stuff to the regular triptych peptides. Yeah. So so you can look for these things. I mean, and again, uh, we are the nice thing is that we're gonna be limited by the library. So we're gonna be limited by what we could see with DDA, and we didn't even do any fractionation. So this is gonna be a even if we went and looked for everything we would have a fairly limited view of what everything is. So let's go, let's build our library and get a sense of what, what we can find by DDA in the sample. Um, and, and so the term library, spectral library, assay library, they get used a lot. And in, in our case, we, t we view the sort of a wider view of a library is sort of just a bunch of information that was collected uh, and, 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 and getting all of that, and that doesn't necessarily mean, everything that's in the library doesn't necessarily become a target for us. Uh, the Abrasol lab talks frequently about spectral libraries and assay libraries, and their version of an assay library, which we're gonna see later, is something where they've made all kinds of choices. So they might have chosen to target things with neutral losses, they might, they might have chosen to target you know, things that only they can get three transitions. So some of the choices we're making here get made sort of uh, implicitly in the assay library, and then you're kind of stuck with those all those choices. So Skyline really tries to stick with raw data and then, and then put all the choices into these settings. So we're gonna build a, you know, a broad view of a spectral library. We're just, we're gonna make a few choices up front, but mostly we're just gonna build a lot of raw data into a spectral library. So we're going to uh, we're going to name our spectral library. So uh, we'll call it Yeast Simple, um, and then we have to tell Skyline where to put it. So click Browse, uh, and we'll put it in the spectral library folder. So you can see Scott, Scott has already given it a name, yeast underscore simple dot glib. We just have to say where to put it and then click save. Uh, we're gonna, we'll go ahead and keep the redundant library, which is really mostly important uh, for viewing all of this spectra and for, um, and if we wanna continue to build on it later. Uh, but if we were to, if we just want a single one-time throwaway library, you know we don't we don't we may not need all the redundant information. Uh, the cutoff in this case 
So if I, if I hover over the cutoff, Skyline gives me an explanation of what it is. Uh, and it sort of comes from peptide profit, which is the top, top list, TPP, PEPEX, and well, peptide profit. So one is really good, and zero is really bad in this cutoff. And so in, but in every case, we, so Skyline can build out of the, the results out of like 20 different search engines. And, uh, and so in a search engine where the probability of value there are plenty of them where it's like a key value, and then zero is really fantastic, and one is terrible, and so so you just have to think about those as one minus the number. So in this case, we're going to be working with data that has Q values, and so we'll say 0 0.99, which would give us a 1% false discovery rate. So who can name some other probability values that, that uh, other search engines might have? Who's using another search engine that doesn't generate a Q value? For example, is posterior error probability. Okay, so what's, a, what's the difference between a Q value and a posterior error probability? <laughs> so if I, have, if I have a 0.9 Q value, what does that mean? That means I'm at a place where everything else that has a higher Q value or has a low, no, 0.9. If I have, let's look, forget the 0.9 thing. Uh, if I have a 0.1 Q value, that means that everything with a lower Q value probably contains about 10% false discoveries, right? Now, if I have a if I have a 0.1 or if I have a 0.1 posterior error probability, what does that mean? Specific for this particular hit, right? Yeah, for that particular hit and any hit like it, then I have like a one in ten. I have a one in ten chance of it being a false discovery. So it's just you know, and and it may be that a one in ten chance of a false discovery. That if I add up everything that has a one in ten chance of false discovery, I might still have a you know a point zero 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 one false discovery rate when I reach that point. And that really depends on the shape of my curve. Yeah, anyway. Well, I would say have minus log p. What? Minus log p values. Minus log p values. Yeah. So I need to convert that to something. So what is, what, is, what is your search engine? Peaks. Peaks? Well, we deal with peaks. So we get, we get, a, we get a, a normal p value out of that somehow. Some some sort of some sort of probability value that fits between zero and one. So we maybe if if you if you think about it as minus log p, we might just like we might just exponentiate it and 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 uh, and so anyway. So everything gets converted into this zero to one range. Yeah. Is it true that for example, Max Planck, that I have an FDR cut of of point oh one anyway? So then it actually yeah. doesn't matter what I enter yeah. here, I could also enter yeah. zero? Yeah, you can enter zero. So if you have a piece of software, Spectrum Mill does this as well, if you have a piece of software that has already done all the filtering and you don't care, you don't really want Skyline to do, you want to include everything in your library, you just put a zero there. And, and Skyline will include everything. But that's not the case here, so let's keep going. We don't have any IRTs in these data, so we'll just keep going. Uh, and now we want to add files. And we want to just add this all perp.xml, which is going to include these two SQT files. So this, is, this was run in our old lab uh, a, a long time ago, uh, you know, in the Macos lab a while ago. Uh, and then click OK. And so now we're ready to build the library. Click, click Finish. It will build very quickly. Uh, and then you get this ability to take a look at it. You also get this information that there were uh, ambiguous peptides. What's an ambiguous peptide? An ambiguous peptide match. Any ideas? A spectrum that would fit to two sequences? Yeah, so, so there are some spectrum that, that's, that, 
the search engine said, well, it could be this or it could be this. And, and in terms of targeted, uh, you know, if we want to actually target things, we would prefer to have things that are, are much, we're much more confident are representative of our peptide. So we don't want to be using dot products on things that could have interference. So even if, it, even if the spectrum really did come from the two things and it's a chimeric spectrum, we still don't really want to use it as, a, as our, you know, our canonical spectrum for this peptide. So that's why the default is just to get rid of these. We could, we could have chosen to keep them, but in general, unless you're doing MS1 filtering, I wouldn't, make, I wouldn't recommend it. Well, is, this, is, is this coming for any type of engine, or as you said, if you filter and you already filter data, you may not get this, because we already yeah. filter with their engine, so that once you can progress the out of five kids, you might, yeah, you might, but so there's still, even even then, you will find that search engines will go like, well, I matched it to two things, you know, like, there are two things that that have really good Q values, you know, they have really good, score. they score so well that they separate from everything else, and I'm gonna include two things, so Mascot does that, lots of, lots of search engines do, do that. No, so. in case you have the option to choose only Okay, that's good. So, 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 yeah, you won't see this. If if you if your search engine picks one thing, you will not you will not see this. This is only when you have a search engine that allows for two peptides getting assigned to the same spectrum. Same spectrum. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, modifications. Uh, should we do modifications? I guess let's take a look at our spectral library. Yeah. Okay, so so we'll just leave it with carbamide methyl cysteine and click OK. Uh, and now you can see that we get a library match here. I guess we're out of time, so we'll just take a quick look at our spectral library. This is what we got. You can see. So this is not, you know, this, even for yeast, 1,182 uh, peptides or precursors is not a, a great, a great haul. Um, we can go ahead and click here. Uh, does everybody have BNY, or maybe some people don't have both BNY? Make sure those are both click. Make sure doubly charged are clicked, because you'll find that there's a, a fair number of doubly charged ions in triply charged peptides. Um, and you can take a quick look at this. You can see, if you're paying attention, you can see that uh, the retention time here is changing. We have a really highly precise retention time. And, uh, and then you can see what file the, the, the spectrum came from. If you click this dot, dot, dot button, then you can see some information. We recorded the cutoff we used, and you can see that actually one of these files is really garbage. Uh, let's see. I think these might be size fractions, so we have one, 105K and 157K. Uh, we do not have very much in, this, in one of these samples, and we have most of everything coming from the other one. So this is not, not a great library, but we would continue ahead and, and, and pick some, uh, we'll, and we will. We'll come back tomorrow and actually pick some targets out of here. Uh, this is, this is we've now, we've completed um, sort of all the settings uh, for the document, and the last thing that remains is to choose some targets. Uh, and we can go, we can actually, let's, let's just choose one target, you can type pyruvate. So if you, if you just make sure your selection is on this blank, this blank blue thing and type pyruvate, uh, D, D carb, maybe that's enough. Uh, and then we're looking for this 
first one, YLR 044C. So that just, we happen to have some prior uh, information that tells us that's what we're interested in. And, and we can see that we have five, five peptides for that based on the spectra in our library. And some of them actually even have multiple charge states. And you can see that skylines automatically pick precursors and six fragment ions. Okay? So that's, we could go, we could go analyze just that, but tomorrow we'll look at a little bit more at what other, other ways to add targets, and then we'll import some data into that. Uh, and I'm going to turn things over to my co-presenters. Thanks for those of you who showed up early.